one point I started following all these like postpartum weight loss people. And I was like, wait a minute, maybe actually I shouldn't be doing that because it's not in my control. Right. Now there's obviously some reason within there. That's so true. The more and more I dive into this is there's no one size fits all approach. This random person from Iowa who doesn't look anything like me has a totally different experience, probably has five kids and, you know, was a triathlete. (laughs) Yeah, literally. (laughs) Yeah. Like there can be so many like X factors that have nothing to do with your life, but you're going to say, well, they got the result that I wanted. So I'm going to somehow reverse engineer this process so that it fits me, which is absolutely scientifically impossible. Hey everyone, I'm Morgan Debon, a passionate entrepreneur and life advisor. With the Journey Podcast, you'll discover that success isn't about the destination, it's about the journey. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've taken control of their lives. Join me on my own journey to discover the secret sauce behind reaching success with permission from no one else. Welcome back to the Journey Podcast. I'm your host in all things chaos, life, business entrepreneurship, and you know, general podcasting things. It's Morgan Devon. We are back with another episode. I'm so excited. I'm actually already hungry just thinking about what we're about to get into today. Here with Joanne Molinaro, and we are going to talk all things veganism, uh, talking about the culture today as it relates to health, questioning some of the things that we've all been perhaps taught. I've been deep in Joanne's Instagram and thinking about the blue zone. And you guys know I spent a lot of time in Costa Rica, which has different parts of Costa Rica fall in the blue zone. And um, anyways, we're going to get into it. So buckle up. If you are interested in any of these topics, this is an episode for you. Joanne, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Morgan. So uh, you are a New York Times bestselling author of an incredible cookbook. I want to start about making food a part of your purpose. How did you get started with this? Yeah. Well, I think it's a very oft repeated tale. Uh, It was my boyfriend (laughs) at the time. You know how it is. I'm sure many women can relate. Many men can relate. When you start a romantic relationship with somebody, you sort of pull out all the stops to impress them. And for me, that was cooking for him. I wanted to make him all of the best foods and show him I can do anything I put my mind to was a little glitch in that plan when he decided to go vegan. And I was like, (laughs) oh no, (laughs) now I need to start cooking vegan food. I don't even know what that looks like. I wasn't quite convinced he knew what that looked like. And so I had to switch to making plant-based foods, ultimately joined him in going vegan and cutting out animal products from my diet for health reasons. And Mm -hmm. that's really the story. Wow. Simple, but effective. (laughs) (laughs) Can be, if you know what buttons to push. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Are we still with this man today? Oh yeah, we got married and now we run the Korean vegan together. Okay, well, it's a happy ending then, and it worked out. Yes, it did. (laughs) So in terms of the work that you do, tell me a little bit about what inspired you to actually write your cookbook. Well, I started the Korean vegan in 2016, again, because my then boyfriend went vegan and, you know, he's, he's very smart. And he said, God, you're such a good cook. You should share your vegan recipes and masterpieces on YouTube. You're the Korean vegan. And I was very <laughs> incentivized by that sort of feedback. And I started my YouTube channel, my Facebook, my Instagram, and ultimately my blog that year. And, uh, you know, social media was so different back then. Mm -hmm. I would just post little photos of what I made for dinner for the both of us. And it was gaining some traction on all of those platforms, not really YouTube, but at least Instagram and Facebook. And probably about a year after I started that, I then began to share little snippets of my stories from home, what Mm. it was like growing up as a Korean American, a child of immigrants in the United States. As you may recall, 2017 was an incredibly divisive year in our country. And I wanted to do what I could to help bring people to the table again and be civil and nice and empathetic to each other. And it was by virtue of that sort of writing project. These are just captions on my Instagram, very short little snippets again, that I drew the attention of a woman who had a very popular vegan Instagram account 
who happened mm-hmm. to be working with a literary agent to write her own mm-hmm. cookbook. And mm-hmm. she said, you know, your writing is so great. I really want you to write a book. I would love for you to meet my lit agent. Maybe you could write a book too. And that's mm-hmm. really how it started. Wow. Well, you have over 5 million followers across all of your platforms. So it worked out. (laughs) (laughs) And the book came out this past year. You've gone on a bit of a tour. I know it's been selling really well. Let's talk about your tradecraft of content creation. One of the things is I was even prepping for this interview, I got lost in your storytelling. And I'm sure that happens to many people, but I was kind of just going through the motions. I had a busy week finishing up my own book manuscript, which is due at the end of this week. Although it's been due like five times. So I keep pushing it back, but it's, it is like final, final, like this must be sent in to the publisher. And so I just, you know, sometimes when I'm in the flow, like I'm just like, dur, 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 dur. so I had podcast prep and I was watching your YouTube channel. And I think when I was following on Instagram, like I knew I saw the storytelling, but I think on YouTube it's longer or it just feels different because it's more immersive because it's just like wider screen. And I sat there for 45 minutes. I think how you approach it is really engaging and it immediately made me feel like connected to you and vulnerable when we haven't even met. And I'm curious, how have you like embraced the courage to be so open to strangers on the internet? Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations on the near completion of your first manuscript. That's a big deal. My book was actually published in 2021. So it's been out for almost three years now and it's been amazing. I just handed in my second manuscript a couple days ago. So I'm feeling it for you, girl. I can't wait for you to hand it in. It's a big deal. In terms of your question, sharing on the internet is a risk, particularly when it's about things that you remain a little bit unhealed about. Out. And I mm-hmm. talk about that, you know, in some of the posts I did recently as it relates to weight loss, my body dysmorphic disorder, uh, my disordered eating. And I talk about that a lot on my YouTube channel. As you note, my YouTube is very different from my Instagram and certainly my TikTok. And I think that that's intentional as a content creator. It's important to tailor your content to the communities that you develop in your respective platforms. If you try to do a one-size-fits-all approach, you're probably not capitalizing on the optimization opportunities you have within those very unique communities. Mm -hmm. YouTube is very used to long form. That's how they grew themselves into this institution that we know when it comes to content And most people now are watching their YouTube on their television, some in fact in lieu of TV. Mm -hmm. And so that is exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to create an immersive experience. People love vulnerability. They respond to vulnerability because when so much of what we do nowadays happens in front of a computer screen or with AirPods in our ears or, you know, with a phone in our hand, we are inevitably isolating ourselves from physical human contact. So what we try to do is create sort of a a semblance of that by being vulnerable on those screens, on the computer screen, on the television screen, on Mm -hmm. the phone screen, to remind people that maybe even if we're not physically connecting, none of us are ever really alone. Mm, Yeah. What percentage of people that you think come to your pages are coming for recipes or coming for that sense of meditation? You know, a comment that I often receive on my content is I came for the recipes, I stayed for the stories. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, I'm sure you're very familiar with attrition and what that means, the turnover of whether it's consumers, employees, you know, part of the game, of course, is luring people in, getting people to join your vision and say, okay, I'm here with you. That Mm -hmm. is the job of the recipes. That is what the food does. It brings them into the community. Keeping people in community is like so much harder. It's just like keeping people employed, keeping, you know, customers coming back for that second bite. That is so difficult. And I think that is what the role of the stories do. It develops a sense of, okay, I'm not just here for the recipes. I'm here Mm -hmm. for so much more. It makes the brand memorable to people. It makes them feel like they're participating in something bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a similar approach on my social media accounts. It's business focused, but 
I always tell people all the messy things, like just like we were just starting, I had my camera fit towards a piece of art over here. And I was like, oh, you know what? People come for my mess anyway. So let me show them how messy my office slash art studio is. I'm in the process of building an art studio in my backyard. So this is just chaos. And, you know, we're sometimes I think we're so trained and conditioned to show the perfect, to show the like, it's all set up perfectly. And I think you're right that what we're all craving is just existing without the filter. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And I also joined your channel, which I love because I'm like, it's very casual. Like it's even more like just, I mean, that's how it feels. Like, I don't know if that's what your intention is, but how it felt is very like, Hey, just I'm on a walk with my dog. This is what <laughs> I ate. <laughs> you know? And so as you are thinking about the future of your brand and your food empire, how are you thinking about growing in different parts of what you want to put out into the world because social media has changed so much and because like algorithms are harder to hack, it's harder to reach the people who follow you. What are the things that you're thinking about? That's a great question, Morgan. And you know, I only became a full-time and professional content creator in 2021. Uh, before that, mm -hmm. I was a full-time attorney. And so I am relatively new when it comes to struggling with things like the algorithm and making sure that I have a very diversified portfolio. I always say it's very important to have multiple business verticals in your mm -hmm. home, in your structure, uh, because you don't want to put so much burden on just one pillar, then your whole structure will collapse. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's so easy to say that in theory, but it's so much harder to execute that in practice, especially when you have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> Again, as an entrepreneur, I'm sure you can remember a decade ago what it was like starting out as a woman of color in a space dominated by everyone who looks totally different from you and yeah. not very many people who are willing to help you. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of where I am. I'm sort of learning as I go. But to your question, you know, part of it was remembering my roots, which was, well, you started with a website. Don't forget yeah. that, you know, and don't forget the importance and the utility of the internet, the old school Google search internet <laughs> to building community. So we've really doubled down on the website this year in particular, and we're once again, very regularly posting recipes and blog posts to make sure that People who won't find me because the algorithm is choking off any reach to these people will still find me through a basic Google search, right? Then, of course, is the email list. That's so important. We only started developing the email list a couple years ago as a tool to sell books, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. But I have to say in the past couple of months, I've really been leaning into, okay, what are the things that my email subscribers actually want to hear about? And being kind of like you said, messy in my newsletters, which is, this is the realest version of me you're going to get. Sure, it's good writing, but I'm talking about things that I'm thinking about on a weekly basis. And the feedback mm -hmm. has been overwhelmingly rewarding. I mean, I hear stories from people every single week. It's one of my favorite parts of the week is when the newsletter goes out. And then of course, yeah. as you mentioned, the broadcast channel on Instagram, it's just another tool to develop community and to make people feel like there's something more than just recipes to this. There's something more than these overly manicured, orchestrated, choreographed videos that she does. It, there's a human right. behind this. Yeah, absolutely. I have a newsletter that goes out weekly right now. It's not very personalized. It's basically here's the episode for the week and mm -hmm. like, here's some random takeaways. But when I was really in my productivity bag, I would be on a lot of flights. This is the old me. I was on like two, three flights a week. So I would say during flights, I would write the newsletters. And so they were so good. It's so good that now I have them out on drip that people randomly still get. I'm like, this is really good. Maybe you should still read it. But I hope this year to make a little bit more time for the newsletter because I do, I worry a lot about, I don't really worry, but I know because I have the data from our own media brands that like Instagram does not care about us. Facebook does not care about us. TikTok does not care about us. Like all this whole creator first, et cetera, is trendy until it's not. And, you know, there's been also more recently, a lot of content creators and influencers who went self-employed in 2020 and 2021 are like, I'm going to get a job because really hard 
<laughs> and there was all this money that was thrown at people and people were able to make real salaries, you know, in the first couple of years. And now they're hitting year three, year four. And it's like, wait a minute, this is actually whack over here. And I should reconsider my balance. <laughs> I should reconsider if this should be a full-time or a side hustle so that I have some more stability in my life. So I share that just so that anyone who's listening in who might be feeling that just know like, yeah, this is like active. You just heard Joanne talk about, you know, she's also figuring it out and she's got 5 million followers. So yeah. note that like, this is a part of the flow, no matter how big we all appear, like it's part of it. Well, I appreciate that, Morgan. I really think that's important for me personally to hear, especially from someone who, again, went through this thing, albeit in a very different forum, probably in a, an even more hostile forum, uh, you know, back when you started. I'm sure there were lots of starts and stops and starts and stops and, and many yeah. times of second guessing and being like, do I even belong here? And I'm certainly going through that. And I'm sure many content creators or, you know, solo entrepreneurs, and they're right. going through that as well. But it's, it's kind of like what you said, which is taking stock of things and also making sure you realize like, it's not you. It's not like you're a failure. It's just, yeah. you know, you got to roll with it. Yeah. Yeah. The market shifts. And I think getting ahead of it is important and owning your audience is important. Not being dependent on these platforms and not something at Blavity that we talk a lot about. It's like, look, traffic is going down like crazy on Facebook and stuff. So if people aren't going to discover us from Facebook, what does our direct traffic look like? We look at our source traffic. Are people typing in travelnoir.com or people typing in blabby.com? Okay. Well, they have that habit or that behavior, then they're never going to stop. There's only a few websites that I literally type into the URL. You know what I mean? And that's so, so powerful. So even we redid, I'm going off track here, but this is what people listen to podcasts for. But we redid our homepage because one of the insights was the people who are most loyal to our platforms and our brands, they type in the homepage on a regular basis because they're just like, what's happening today? And so they type in blabby.com to see... And they might not even click, but they'll spend like three minutes on the homepage because they're like scrolling and reading like the first two sentences. So we redid the site to super serve those people because when they do click, they click on like five or six articles. I love that. That's so smart. I never even thought of that. I mean... I think for me, I was always like, well, I want people to know who Joanne is as soon as they land on the website. And it's like, well, if that's not what they're going there for, I mean, you can make that an option, but what if they really want is just to kind of know what's the newest recipe? What is Joanne talking about this week? You know, what's yeah. her thought? You know, I think that's so smart. And it also takes a lot of gumption to be like, I'm just going to redo this website. Yes. Websites are so hard to do. Yes. yes. <laughs> so just to redo yes. even the front page is like massive undertaking. <laughs> it is massive. It is massive. I happen to have 200 employees. But other than that. Good for I, you, girl. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, and, you know, I'm just full transparency. <laughs> it is massive, but I have people for it. So um, it, it is a slight empire. But. But even on my personal brand, we're redoing my personal brand website. And that is an employee of one. And <laughs> so I got, you know, people in Ukraine coding it up. And yeah, doing exactly. It, you know, it's hustle life. So, so don't worry. I, I wear both hats. Awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. Also, frankly, sometimes the people in Upwork are like 10 times better than random people. Oh, oh here. my God. I had somebody on Upwork. Just this is a little hint because I know you're working on your manuscript. Yeah. I had somebody from Upwork edit you know, with the first pass of my manuscript before I sent it to my editor because I suck at proofreading <laughs> and catching typos. And I was like, I'm not plowing through 86,000 words. I'm going to hire somebody to do this. And they did yeah. a phenomenal job. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, it might be a little late because it's due tomorrow, but I did have someone on Upwork help me with my illustrations because I have like diagrams and matrices and things like that. So I would like sketch it out, take a picture, and then they would like make it Brilliant. Pretty. Yes, a little stuff like that. I'm a, I'm an advocate of Upwork. Upwork should pay me because I feel like I've given them. So they should many be times. sponsoring this podcast episode. <laughs> somebody send this to somebody at Upwork, please. Thank you. But yes, anyways, get back on topic. I guess I'm curious, like 
one of the things that you talked about on your social media recently is just like everything going on in the healthcare world. And you mentioned, and you've talked about this before in your videos, your personal experience with body dysmorphia. I don't know how one diagnoses body dysmorphia, like, but I think we're all self-diagnosing it to some extent. I've talked about it before on the podcast, but when I was pregnant, I got really big and I'm 4'11". And so I've worked really hard my whole life to be fit go to the gym four or five times a week. I don't count calories, but I just look at what I'm eating, make sure I have protein first, you know, like simple stuff. And when you're pregnant, you kind of have to let go of all of that because your body is storing fat intentionally. And so I gained 45 pounds on a 411 frame. No, I got body addy, so it looks kind of proportionate, but it's still a lot for me. And when I had the baby, you know, you think, yeah, the baby you're gonna, it's gonna just float off, you know, your breastfeeding, it's gonna just fall off. It has not Mm -hmm. fallen off. (laughs) So it's been an interesting few months. I had a new wardrobe for my maternity clothes. I had my old wardrobe for my cute, you know, size four life. And then it's really size two, size four, you know, but then now I'm a size 10. (laughs) So it's been a big adjustment. And I had to change the inputs that I had in my life. So I started following petite, curvy, you know, mid-sized folks. And one of the things that I've been learning is just like how bullshit sizing is in this country. Like the average size, I think in America is like size 12 or size 14. Like that's the average. So then it's like, why does it take so long to get to a size 12 when you're in the store, when you're like shopping? Why does it have to be a large or extra large, you know? And I never had a consciousness of it because I always had the privilege and worked hard for the size that I was in. And simultaneously, the world is on Ozempic. Mm-hmm. And I'd say like 50% of the women in my life, maybe 30% are on some form of semi-glutide. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Like people you wouldn't even think. Like even like people in my family, I'm like, hmm. Wow. A lot. And I didn't know it. Like it, it's not like this is something people talked about, but like ran and like, oh, you look so good. And then they would like say, oh, I've been on this for a year. And I'm like, oh. Excuse me, what? <laughs> and so at the same time in which I've gotten bigger, the world has gotten smaller. And that's just been like really fucking with my head. And anyways, this is a long-winded way of just opening up the conversation. How have you been thinking about it? I mean, you've talked about like being in some way a challenger of the pharmaceutical industry and big pharma. Like, where are you and what's kind of the conversations that you've been having online recently? I think that, uh, you know, necessarily consider myself an activist against big pharma or challenger of it. It's more just like, I don't like it. I'm a big believer in trying to treat the body and prevent illness through nutrition and diet first and exercise first. Obviously, like I still take drugs if I need to. I I think your physician is your first person that you talk to when it comes about your medical health. And if their advice is to take medication, that's something you should absolutely consider. It's just not something that I prefer to do if I can avoid it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so much that goes into, especially the healthcare system in the United States that makes it unhealthy. (laughs) I don't know how else is like extremely unhealthy for our bodies and for our brains, our mental health. And I think the more we could capitulate to this sort of broken system that pervades our society here in the United States, the more we continue to prop it up, whether mm-hmm. we want to or not. And I definitely see the semi I don't, I don't exactly know how to pronounce it, but you know, the Wegovy and the mm-hmm. Ozempics of the world. I think that's just another tool that Big Pharma is now going to be utilizing in order to keep everybody in line, to make sure that their system, the one that know, inures to their bottom line and their profit remains intact for decades and decades, for generations and generations, because now they have found a tool that so many, apparently at least 30% of your peers are buying into. So why wouldn't they? The incentives that have been put into place in this system make it exactly that, which is that they'll stay in this position of power. And I have so many issues and concerns with these drugs. Uh, Number one, the disparate availability. People who cannot afford good health care do not have access to good health care. 
will not be able to get on this drug. I mean, I was just, I've received a lot of feedback on the social media posts and the newsletters on this topic. I Mm -hmm. received an email just yesterday from a woman who said I was qualified for insurance for the first year. But then of course, when you lose the weight, are you going to remain qualified? Well, some of my girlfriends, they were qualified. Now they're super under the BMI range. And now they're paying a thousand dollars a fucking well, I was like, girl, what are we doing? Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what's happening. And from what I understand, I've read a lot of research. I mean, I've read a lot of research on these drugs um, because I'm sort of obsessed with it. But my understanding is if you get off of these drugs, you will regain all of that weight and then some. And so the chances are you're going to have to stay on this drug for the rest of your life if you want to maintain that slim build. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's the thing is, you know, they lure you in with either coupons, discount codes, or qualification under insurance. But then once you get there, in order to stay there, you start having to pay a thousand dollars a month. And so Right there, then we know that there is a very small group of people in our country who can then afford to be, quote, this healthy or look this slim. Mm. And that just reinforces a power dynamic in our country that I think is already very toxic. So that's number one. And number two is sort of, well, you know, what happens to confronting what we've all been conditioned to believe, which is what your show is all about, is challenging some of these norms, challenging the rules that we think we need to live by, which is we all need to look a certain way. Mm-hmm. We all need to be built thin and small and petite. We all need to fit into the size zeros, twos, and fours instead of the average normal size of a human female body. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, well, you know what? I'm just so tired of fighting against this rule. I'm just going to give into it. Yeah. That is an understandable inclination, especially for women. We have been fighting and fighting and fighting against these norms our entire lives. Yeah, We deserve a little bit of a break. And so we tell ourselves, well, this drug is going to give us a little bit of a break. Yeah. So I deserve this drug and I'm going right. to do it. And it's very hard to argue against that. I really don't know what the no, argument for that is. Yeah. No, I get it. I mean, especially when there's a stigma that because you're above a certain BMI, you have a certain level of rolliness. I call it Miami tummy, that it's a signal of laziness, that it's a signal of lack of effort. It's a signal of lack of discipline that because you have roles, it's because of course you must not be working out. Of course you must be secretly binge eating somewhere. Of course, you know, it's something in your control, right? I, yeah. You know, it's so interesting. Uh, Washington Post recently did an article about women posting like video recordings of themselves getting an IUD inserted and how painful it is. Hmm. And for a long time, I think many medical professionals really downplayed the amount of pain uh, IUD insertion causes. I certainly know it was one of the most painful experiences I went through. I passed out. I couldn't walk for an hour. It was horrible. Oh my gosh. And I posted my comment and there were so many people who said I had the exact same experience. And it led me to think, well, maybe this is like a thing. Like this is not just me in my head thinking I have a low pain threshold. Right. And it's the same thing now with weight loss. I think conventional wisdom, or if you can call it wisdom, suggest, well, if you're not losing weight, it's because you're not doing something right. Yeah. Yeah. You're not dieting enough. You're not working out enough. You're not X, Y, Z enough. And now I'm starting to think that maybe there is a growing body of science that suggests that is a very, very grossly oversimplified understanding of the body's, you know, resistance to weight loss, particularly if for whatever reason, your college years, you gained a little bit of weight, (laughs) you know, there's all sorts of things that go into the human metabolism that still confounds science. And for people to create all these proxies based upon what they see when they walk past someone on the sidewalk is just totally unfair. It's misinformed. But again, it feeds into this idea of, well, maybe there's a quick fix out there with these weight loss drugs. That's right. And I know what you just articulated is part of what my brain has been saying, which is, you know how to be fit, but right now you're not fit because your body is saying, hold on to the fat because you're breastfeeding. And so if you weren't breastfeeding and you hadn't had a baby, you would have 
manage this by now because you know how to eat right and you know how to work out and you're doing those things. But science and biology is saying, we don't give a fuck about what your behaviors are. We're doing a core job right now, which is feeding another human being and we need to hold on to the fat more, right? And so that just reinforced like, okay, yeah, maybe our bodies are smarter than we think. <laughs> and this idea of, because at one point I started following all these like postpartum weight loss people. And I was like, wait a minute, maybe actually I shouldn't be doing that because it's not in my control, right? Now there's a, obviously some reason within there, but like, it's not my fault, I think that that's so true. The more and more I dive into this is there's no one size fits all approach. Like again, I think that it's, it's very tempting, especially if you're a new mother and you're going through something that you haven't been through before to say, well, I'm just going to rely on the anecdotal evidence that people are providing to me. I'm going to go onto my Facebook groups. I'm going to go into my chats. I'm going to go read this article and look at the comments and say, well, this random person from Iowa who doesn't look anything like me has a totally different experience, probably has five kids and, you know, was a triathlete. (laughs) Yeah, literally. (laughs) Yeah. Like there can be so many like X factors that have nothing to do with your life, but you're going to say, well, they got the result that I wanted. So I'm going to somehow reverse engineer this process so that it fits me, which is absolutely scientifically impossible. But that's unfortunately what the internet has done. That's Mm -hmm. one of the drawbacks is flattening the human experience into these really ridiculous black and white proxies that don't make any sense, but put so much pressure on us as human beings to fit into this mold that probably never should have been applied to us in the first place. A hundred percent. So again, anyone watching this, listening to this, like try to like curate your inputs better, Yeah. you know, and I completely agree with you, Joanne, like in terms of thinking about if you are going to follow advice from someone, if you are going to look at someone as a guide, like consider how much they match your set of characteristics and your biology and, 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 and even then there's no way they can match your genetics and like the things that were passed down from our ancestors and all the things you guys know, I've talked about this in other podcasts with other people, but just like the level of how much your genetics and your parents' life history and your grandparents' life history actually impacts your stress levels, your ability to manage ups and downs and lefts and rights. So I won't go into that right now, but I want to talk about blue zones Mm. because there was a Netflix show or documentary about blue zones I started watching it and I was like oh so good because I spent so much time in Costa Rica so I'm like I'm already kind of halfway there (laughs) (laughs) okay I already drink matcha so I'm like I feel like I'm blue zone-esque as much as one can be in Tennessee where everything is a steak (laughs) And, and I guess I'm just like curious how did you get into blue zone research and like Just talk to me a little bit more about this part of your brain. Well, I'm really glad you asked because that is actually going to be at least tangentially the focus of this week's newsletter. And it's something that's been of particular relevance in the past month. But, you know, to be completely candid, uh, the reason I decided or I committed to removing meat from my diet all the way back in 2016, although it was certainly in part because my boyfriend was going vegan, ultimately the full-time commitment to that was because my father was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And there was just so much evidence that suggested that his like change in diet when he came to the United States, a more Western diet, which included a lot more red meat, Mm -hmm. could have been very responsible for that diagnosis because, you know, science showed that prior to the Westernization of East Asian diets, East Asian men were not getting prostate state cancer. Mm. And so that was really an eye opener for me. So the idea of living longer and promoting good health has always been one of the big pillars of my veganism and health and fitness is a big component of our lives at home. My husband is extremely healthy as well, or Mm -hmm. health conscious, I should say. I think in the past month, we've realized that just cutting out meat isn't always enough. There are certain ways that we can be even more intentional about the food that we're putting into our bodies, again, to maximize longevity. And, you know, as vegans, we're always like, fiber, fiber, eat the more fiber, you know, because it was like such a big thing about a vegan diet. But 
we weren't actually doing the best job of really focusing on how many legumes we were eating a day, yeah. you know, whole grains and things like that. And we still love to eat delicious foods. So we're always like, yeah, pour on the extra virgin olive oil. <laughs> yeah. So the past month, I've been focusing a lot on creating recipes that really promote the consumption of insoluble fibers, ratcheting back on the processed ingredients, even a little bit of the oil and trying to make things low fat, high mm -hmm. fiber, moderate protein, and, mm. and just really balanced. But I think the challenge with that, Morgan, and I'm sure you can relate to this is, you know, you're just talking about Nashville. Nashville has a rich and beautiful history of barbecue mm -hmm. and, and the flavors of barbecue. I've spent some time in both Nashville and Memphis and, and mm -hmm. can definitely attest to that. Well, then how do you accommodate these sort of rich cultures, these right. wonderful, you know, heritage based stories in a healthier way, yeah. like the healthier diet? And so for me, the challenge always remains, how do I Koreanize? these mm -hmm. blue zone recipes. So we mm -hmm. take a minestrone soup, which is a classic Mediterranean blue zone recipes, lots of different colors, antioxidants, and tons of fiber. Well, how do I make my Korean parents eat that? Yeah. They're not really into Mediterranean food, yeah. you know? <laughs> so that's really the challenge is trying to incorporate some of my own cultural cuisine as well as cultural stories in recipes that are designed to help you live a longer and healthier life. And what are some of the just principles for those who may be new to kind of the blue zone basics? You mentioned fiber, you mentioned a colorful plate. What are some other things that people should be thinking about? Well, in terms of diet, those are really the big things is how can I incorporate more fiber into each plate? Like I always try to think of fiber, like making up 50% of my plate. Oh, wow. So what is on my plate and how much fiber are they bringing to the game? Because I can guarantee you none of us are eating as much fiber as we need. And when mm -hmm. you look across the blue zones, the areas where people are living the longest, they're getting like 50 grams of fiber a day. Most I don't even of us, know what that looks like. I know. I, most of us are getting maybe between 7 and 13. Yeah. We're not anywhere near where even the United States says their recommended, you know, amount of fiber, which is in the 20s, right? Yeah. And so, but when you actually look at those who have optimized their diets to make themselves live over 100 years, which is, you know, what the blue zones are, they're eating like 50 grams of fiber a day. So I always try and look at my plate and say, how am I going to get to 50 grams today? I never I actually succeed. But you know, that's sort of the name of the game. The other thing, of course, is I always say eat the rainbow. And there are so many peer reviewed studies out there that prove that eating very colorful plant food mm -hmm. is going to help with guarding against cancer, heart disease, and other chronic illnesses that ultimately lead to a shorter life. So mm -hmm. if we could eat red cabbages, we can eat purple sweet potatoes, if we can eat red bell pepper, the darker and more pigmented your food, the better your body is going to feel and the stronger it is going to be able to fight off some of these diseases. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, some of the basics, which is avoid eating too much saturated fat, avoid yeah. eating too many salty processed foods. And for me, you know, I think the science is pretty clear, avoid eating too much or any meat. There's no fiber in meat. I tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and also, it's often high in cholesterol and saturated fats. Right. I think what's interesting is that a lot of the healthy narratives right now are protein forward, protein first. And what you're suggesting is fiber first. Um, I am such a fiber first, but here's what I say. I'm a big proponent of protein first because like you, I come from a you know fitness driven lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, worked out. Yeah I, yeah. yeah. I run every day. I do lift weights at least four to five times a week. So I right. do need my protein. So what I'm trying to do is find protein sources that also have fiber. I like so. Black. Yeah. Like beans, black beans, yeah. lentils, mm. chickpeas. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are great sources of protein that also happen to be fiber rich. So why not like kill two birds with one stone? Not very vegan, but you know what I mean? <laughs> get the yeah. most bang from your buck and get them both yeah, <laughs> as opposed okay. to dividing your plate and making things so inefficient. Yeah. One of the things that I've been working on 
as always, is like, what are the norms that I've been taught or told that like actually make no sense when you question them? And one of them is like breakfast foods in America, like the bacon, eggs and sausage and pancakes. Like, and so I've been like playing with, well, screw the rules. What are the things that actually make sense for me for breakfast? And I've been playing with really weird stuff like boiled eggs with like rice and kimchi. Like I've been playing with also different cultures. And then it's like, okay, no, like, okay, sauteed spinach, scrambled egg whites and toast. I can't figure out the fibers. Like what are your suggestions or what have you been eating for breakfast? Well, I think that's, first of all, amazing that you're questioning the norms of the standard American breakfast. I highly encourage that. And one of the most beautiful things I heard in that is that you're open to other cultural cuisines at the Mm -hmm. breakfast table. So one of the things that I've been very influenced by, of course, is the way Korean people eat. They do not eat like a different meal for breakfast. Mm. Breakfast looks very similar to lunch, which looks very similar to dinner. So we often eat, yeah, a bowl of rice, some soup like tenjang jjigae, which is like, you know, uh, almost like miso soup, but a lot more concentrated. Um, We'll have a little bit of protein, like maybe some tofu. We'll have some mung beans. So like there are all sorts of things that I think we are excluding from our breakfast table because we think, like you said, it needs to be sweet, like pancakes or you yeah, know, carby. even exactly heavy on the carbs, or it needs to be bacon, which is, I'm sorry, it's not good for you. You might as well no, be lighting up a cigarette. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> it's delicious. And there are a lot of things that like, you know, I have people I know who eat cupcakes for breakfast and I'm like, wow. <laughs> um, yeah. Pancakes, basically, okay. But basically, yeah. I mean, the, there's cake in, in the name. But I think that for me, one of the things I, I'm actually going to post it tomorrow is my take on oatmeal. So many people think of oatmeal as, again, a sweet breakfast. They put cinnamon sugar in it. They put fruits in it. They put, mm-hmm. you know, yogurt in it, sweet yogurt in it, and mm-hmm. overnight parfaits and things yes. like that. To me, it's like, why not just make it savory? Hmm. You know, you know, add um, your favorite savory ingredients to your oatmeal. That way you get a ton of fiber in yeah. the morning, a little bit of protein in the morning. And if you add protein, a healthy protein to that bowl of oatmeal, then you get a double dose of protein. Yeah. And so what I like to do, and this is I got from my mom because you know she's Korean and she mm-hmm. needs to eat more oatmeal because she's trying to lower that cholesterol, mm-hmm. is she does add roasted seaweed to her oatmeal. She mm-hmm. adds a little bit of sesame oil to her oatmeal. She adds some roast sesame seeds to her oatmeal. Mm-hmm. These are the basic things that you would add to rice. Yes. Instead, she's doing it to her oatmeal. And I think that's so smart. And it really opens up this universe of like, oh, wait, oatmeal doesn't need to be sugary. It yeah. can also be savory. And that way I can add a bunch of proteins to it without it being weird. Okay, well, now I'm going to do that for lunch. <laughs> For breakfast, I made tuna. I've been into tuna cottos and we spent a month in LA and I mean, they don't have tuna cotto in Nashville. Oh. <laughs> so I looked up the recipe and emulsified my tuna and did a whole thing. But for lunch, I'm going to try oatmeal. I love seaweed, um, the things that come in the little containers. The snacks. Yeah. Like yeah. That's seaweed. what, yeah. You just tear it over. Yeah. I love them. I just devour them. So yes. And then maybe what about protein? Maybe a boiled egg. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, to me, I'm, a, you know, cause I'm plant-based. I always go with like lentils or chickpeas or black beans, or of course, tofu, which is my favorite protein source. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I do, but don't underestimate the amount of protein you'll find in your greens, like in spinach or yeah. kale. Uh, then you get that fiber, you get the antioxidant bang from your buck. I mean, you get the cruciferous greens in your body, which have been proven to fight cancer and all sorts of other chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. So these are, you know, kind of the things that I'm always thinking about is even that brown bowl of oatmeal, (laughs) how can I make it more colorful? I love it. Well, we've talked about a variety of things. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about today? No, we've really covered the gamut here, Morgan. I feel like we've discussed like every important thing that we need to discuss. <laughs> yeah, no, we did pretty good. We did pretty good. Amazing. So how can people connect with you? Um, what are your handles? And let's also just leave with maybe just other things that people could or should be thinking about if they're exploring blue zones, like other like resources or things that you recommend. 
Sure. So you can find me on the Korean vegan everywhere, whether it's the Korean vegan.com at the Korean vegan on all my social media handles. So that's pretty much where you can find me, my stories, obviously the book called the Korean vegan. So it's pretty easy. In terms of the blue zone, here's my suggestion. Anytime you're thinking about or considering making some type of change to your diet with the aim of improving your health, I think the biggest mistake people often make is trying to do everything at once. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, instead of adding one good ingredient, I'm going to add 15 and I'm going to cut out every bad thing from my diet. (laughs) I mean, going that way works for some people, but for most people, eventually you find that this type of habit change is unsustainable. And then when you don't manage to keep it up, you feel like a failure, you lose your confidence and you just quit altogether. And that is such a waste because you absolutely have the ability and the discipline and all those things that you think you don't you do have it inside of you. You're just not giving yourself enough of a chance to get there. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation is identify a couple of new ingredients that you want to incorporate into your diet before you even think about cutting anything out. You can always cut things out later. I always think people need to remember that it's just as much about what you add to your diet as you take out. So think about it. What's one thing that I can add this week? Maybe it's lentils, maybe it's kale, maybe it's, you know, red cabbage, maybe it's the red bell pepper. Mm -hmm. And then Add to that week by week until you find yourself completely different from the person you were when you started. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Joanne, thank you for joining us on the journey and sharing your story with us today. Thank you for having me. It's been such a pleasure. So fun. Thanks for listening to the Journey Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review and head to our Instagram and YouTube to leave a comment. I look forward to hearing how this podcast has made an impact on your own journey.